Okay, so it's no secret that I really enjoyed our little stint on the Ishimura, but I'm ashamed to say I haven't really experienced much of Isaac's story after that little affair. I absolutely loved my time with him years ago, but when it came time to jump back in the saddle, I guess other games and maybe real life sort of got in the way. So this is going to be a log of my first time figuring out just what the hell happened after all that marker business out in space. So if you'll join me, I think it's about time we checked up on our little engineer friend. What's up guys, I'm Jared from Avalanche Reviews. Welcome to the Dead Space Retrospective. After the massive success of Visceral's first Dead Space game, the boys at EA got right to work on a follow-up, one that would outdo their first attempt in every way, and they did achieve that goal in at least one aspect. Dead Space 2 had a much larger budget than the first game, and nowhere is that more evident than in its advertising campaign. I'm sure you guys all remember the Your Mom Hates Dead Space ordeal, a series of ads that took older women and sat them down in front of footage of the game, and of course they used the more spicy takes to sell it. This for some ridiculous reason became some kind of controversy, leading legally designated landmass Jim Sterling to accuse EA of playing on stereotypes about women, which, correct me if I'm wrong, I don't think counts because they sat them down and recorded their honest reactions, so I guess if anything these women are to blame for the stereotypes about women being perpetuated, I guess. Anyways, this is an accusation that ranks relatively in the middle on the dumb shit Jim Sterling says scale, because if he thinks an ad campaign trying to play the your lame parents would hate this, therefore you should love it card is exploitative, well, let's hope he never finds out about a majority of the game ads from the Genesis and SNES era. But manufactured and totally fictitious controversy aside, the one thing to take away from all this is that Dead Space 2 had a real budget backing it and that won't exactly be relevant till we get a little further into this analysis. Although, before we go there, we should see if an ocean of cash is enough to write a story that achieves as much as the game that came before it. The story of the original Dead Space was kind of a hard act to follow. Sure, it left us with a bit of a cliffhanger, but it's not the kind of cliffhanger you want a resolution for. The story told a pretty complete tale, with Isaac essentially putting an end to all the insanity and getting off the Ishimura, and ideally that would be all she wrote. You know, sometimes it's okay to have a story that ends. One that has a satisfying start and an even more satisfying finish, but Dead Space's world was so big and so fleshed out that the writers made it possible to head back into that world without things feeling inorganic or manufactured. The universe that Isaac and the Ishimura existed in had a real foundation with repeating design motifs and systems like governments and companies that could absolutely be expanded on and I'm happy to say Dead Space 2 does exactly that. Starting off with a little conversation between Isaac and Nicole, where we find out that it was Isaac who convinced her to board the doomed Ishimura in the first place. Isaac, thank you. For what? For just pushing me to do this. Which does retroactively give him even more of a motivation to find her in the first game but then we transition into some kind of interview process. It seems like our guy's escape pod was found and the guy doing the interview wants to know what happened aboard the Planet Cracker. Using this guy as a bit of a narrative device, we get a really cool recap of the previous game's events in a very stylistic way, which I'm really a fan of. During the interview, it looks like the last game's ending pointed us in the right direction with the marker having what might be a permanent effect on Isaac's mind. He's still seeing the apparition of Nicole and it's hostile towards him this time. And judging by his wearing a straitjacket, we can assume that's not the only thing wrong with him mentally. After this scene, we're in Isaac's shoes as he's rudely awoken by someone who says they're trying to help him before an infector jams his tentacle thing into the guy's head and we get to watch the transformation process happen in real time, which is about as brutal as you would imagine. And as a side note, I was under the impression that this could only happen to corpses, but I guess that was never really said out loud in the previous game, so I'm willing to let it slide if it means we get an awesome close-up of what I'm calling the necromorphing process. After this, understandably, Isaac is on the run, and it looks like wherever he is, the necromorph infestation has followed him. 
At this point, I had about a million questions, but those needed to be put on hold since I was essentially wrapped up in a perfect Isaac-sized burrito and surrounded on all sides by misshapen monsters with bone saws for hands. As we make our way out of the more immediate danger, we start piecing together just what the hell is going on around here. Turns out it's been three years since the incident on the Ishimura and Isaac is on the sprawl. No, not the Philip K. Dick cyberpunk dystopia sprawl, but a space station just off of Titan, which interestingly enough is revealed to be the site of the first ever planet crack. I'm not sure why I find that so cool, but it just seems like the perfect kind of world building. Anyways, he's been here the entire time, but can't remember much of it due to his own mental issues and heavy, heavy amounts of sedation. God knows what these people have been pumping him full of. Isaac, we're all gonna burn for what we did to you. <laughs> At first, we're led to believe that he's here because of his experience with the marker had driven him mad, but then we find out there's actually some kind of umbrella-esque shenanigans at play here. It seems like EarthGov has been busy these last few years using the knowledge imprinted on the brains of people who've come into contact with the marker to build their own and I have a little bit of an issue with this idea. For all we've learned about the marker so far, it has no real positive benefits outside of the church, Altman be praised, and I really don't understand why they would take such a risk knowing full well the side effects of making one. Towards the end of the game, we get a single piece of dialogue explaining that they think it's some kind of infinite energy source, but I really don't remember that being the case in the first game. That being said, there may have been something I missed, so maybe we'll call this one even. For now. Our boy's later contacted by a woman wanting to help him escape, and even though Isaac's not keen on trusting her, he doesn't have much of a choice. The giant space station is in the middle of a full-blown necromorph outbreak, and I guess the hell you don't know can't be too much worse than the hell you do, right? He also finds a fellow lab rat by the name of Strauss, who's, well, let's say a little worse off than Isaac. The rest of the story is spent going down several avenues with at the very least two backstabs incoming, and a little bit of Isaac working through his own problems too. Now, I'll be the first person to say, the first time I tried Dead Space 2 out, I got the feeling that you would get when your favorite cult hit movie gets a big budget Hollywood sequel. And the very start of the game doesn't do much to challenge that idea. It has this go big or go home sort of feeling, and the pace is so rapid that it sort of spits in the face of the original's masterful pacing. But I will say this, you have to really stick with Dead Space 2's story. It seems to be going in one very predictable direction at the start. If I had to compare it to anything, it would likely be Resident Evil 2 with its larger budget and more Hollywood action appeal. But truth be told, three quarters of the way into Dead Space 2, well, it started heading in a more Silent Hill 2 direction, which was a big surprise. Now, that's not to say three quarters of the game has a bad story. Actually, it's quite the opposite. I really enjoyed the almost zombie outbreak feeling of walking through these living quarters and seeing signs of people committing suicide to avoid being torn apart while they're still alive and walking by doors with people in the process of turning or have already turned. And I know that may sound like a gameplay thing and not a story thing, but a lot of the story in these games are told through the environment and I think that's no different here. Now, it certainly does have its fair share of cheapness, like the obvious trope of having Isaac dredge through a daycare center complete with child necromorphs. But it also sends us through a church of unitology, which gives us a better insight in how these people tick and what they're like when they're not sabotaging big rusty planet crackers. If the environmental storytelling wowed you in the first game, get ready for that exact same experience, but more of it. Now, I will admit this story's got a different feel from the first games, but I think it still lives up to that Dead Space name. The original had this slow building, kind of creepy and dark thing going on, and the second is a lot more in your face, but it still retains a kind of authenticity. And from a storytelling perspective, this change makes a lot of sense. We as players already know what's after us in the dark corners of this space station, and we're already familiar with what's making them, so it makes sense to start us in the heat of all the action. I mean, if it slowly revealed the necromorphs, I would have likely gotten a little bored, totally knowing what was coming next. Honestly though, I think the best example of how things have changed would be the fact that Isaac not only has a face now, but a personality to go along with it. They're swarming in through a hole in the medical deck. At least you won't have to go through there. Unexpected obstruction ahead. Shutting down. Welcome to the medical deck. Crap. And I think I might be torn on this issue. 
On one hand, he had so much character when all we had to gauge his reactions by were his labored breaths, screams of terror, and body language. And all that's gone now that he can properly express himself. But I really do like his personality in this game. You have him pretty evenly split between wisecracking action hero and deeply damaged, nearly crazy person who just can't let go of the guilt that he feels for the role he played in Nicole's fate. He grows attached to the other characters in the game, gets angry with them, and even expresses frustration that mirrors my own when the old Dead Space trope of nothing working rears its ugly head. It doesn't recognize a new junction. I think I've got it from up here. Just be wired from down here. What? I didn't hear you. Uh, nothing. Nothing. This new side of Isaac is a contentious one, and while I do really enjoy his personality, I can't exactly argue that I wouldn't have loved for him to have remained a silent protagonist. So this will be a subjective take, but if you're worried about Visceral ruining a unique character by having him speak, you're not exactly in the wrong, but I found this new personality to be really engaging anyways. And yeah, maybe there is a bit of the original allure lost now that he can actively comment on things, but it is replaced with what I feel is pretty organic and believable writing, so I guess take that for what it's worth. And since we're talking about differences, it's only fair we talk about how Dead Space 2 stays the same. You'll still be following a voice on your radio, and while you'll often come within mere inches from the people you're communicating with, you aren't going to be fighting back to back with them or anything. If this bothered you in the first game, it'll likely have the same effect here, but I really feel like this was done to make sure that there wasn't any kind of break and the isolating atmosphere the devs worked so hard to cultivate, so I guess we'll call it a necessary evil. And continuing on the subject of aspects of this game that stays the same, if there were one thing this sequel totally gets right, it's expanding on the world of Dead Space to a satisfying degree, but making sure nothing gets over-explained, a trick the first game pulled perfectly. The church, the government, and people of this world are all fleshed out just a little more than they were before, but not so much that they stop feeling interesting or mysterious. Just like before, a lot of the background narrative is handled via text and audio logs, and just like before, these little pieces of self-contained world building are amazingly fun to get lost in. I will say I was a little disappointed when I noticed that there were far few audio recordings than before, with text logs being a majority of what you're going to find, but hey, I'm not opposed to doing a bit of reading if it means getting to know a little bit more about this world and how it operates. I do, however, wonder why this is the case. You would figure that the increased budget would mean more voice actors being able to contribute for more lines, but let's not get lost in minutia. And speaking of minutia, I'd love to start talking a little more specifically, but before I do, I have to throw up a little bit of a spoiler warning here. So if you haven't played through Dead Space 2 yet, skip to the timestamp on screen or click the link in the description to avoid having this awesome tale spoiled for you. Alright, so now that the first timers are gone, we can talk shit about him, and maybe this story. In the first game, we found out that Nicole had been dead the entire time, and this time around, they still have Isaac in absolute torment because he essentially pushed her to join the crew of the Planet Cracker, in a sense dooming her to her own death. And as you near the end of Part 2, you start to see Isaac come to grips with this fact. And as he does, Nicole stops showing up as some kind of evil specter, and more like a helping hand. I felt like this plot thread was handled really well. Isaac struggles because he doesn't want to let her go despite the fact that she's tricked him into almost killing himself several times by this point. Even though he thinks it'll eventually kill him, he just can't let go of her memory. And this was a really cool metaphor for him holding onto his baggage and it making his life worse. When you hear that a game will be covering sensitive subjects like loss, depression, and suicidal thoughts, you always hope for the best, but often we're left with shallow or exploitative writing that just sort of cheapens these concepts. And for a while, I was really impressed that Visual pulled off such a touchy subject with such class. That is, until it was all taken apart a few minutes after the big reveal. Right at the ending confrontation, we figure out that it was all a trick to get Isaac closer to the marker so he can be absorbed. Now don't get me wrong, this last backstab I thought was really effective. But honestly, I would have been more satisfied if this turned out to be a little more like Silent Hill 2, where the main character struggles with an issue and the end of the game coincides with him or her making peace with their inner demons and letting them go. Maybe it's just me, but I was all on board the Isaac using the part of his brain that the marker affected to destroy it, but at the cost of not seeing the apparition of his dead love anymore. If you ask me, this would have been the better way to go, but that being said, I'm not exactly complaining. I just would have liked to have seen the other option explored as well, maybe as an alternate ending or something like that. And real quick, before we let everyone else back in, I just wanted to say that I absolutely loved this game's ending. 
No analysis or critique here, I was just really blown away at how, for lack of a better word, epic it was. By the time the ending credits started rolling, I genuinely found myself letting out a sigh of relief, like I had been tightening myself up the entire ending sequence. Really great A stuff, and I wouldn't have it any other way. Alright, so I think that's enough gushing, let's let the rest of the crew back in. What? Okay, so time to put the cards on the table. I was completely blown away by Dead Space 2's story. At first, I lamented having Isaac shed his silent protag nature and don an honest-to-goodness personality, but I genuinely grew to love it. In that same sense, I really didn't like the stereotypical, two-dimensional character Ellie at first. The game introduces you to her as your average, take-no-shit, hard-ass female character that in any other game you just know would have been a sniper. But as the two interact more and more, she becomes this really endearing personality, and that made the whole badass thing even more emotionally attractive. Typically, I would use this spot in the script for critiques or issues, but I genuinely had none. The story was amazingly satisfying. It had all the explosions and melodrama that a typical action flick would, but also included the emotion and conflict that I would expect from a story-driven affair. For every single step it took towards that cheap and schlocky popcorn fuel feel, it took another in the direction of a serious, dark, and brooding game with massive amounts of world-building and an in-game universe that feels equal parts science fiction and damn near realism. The pace of the story's events makes sure you don't go too long a stretch without it stepping in and reminding you this is a story-driven experience, but also won't have you sitting through 40-minute cutscenes before you get a chance to start disemboweling necromorphs again, so an even section of both sides of the spectrum is represented here. And right about now, I'm gonna say something that is likely to not be very popular. Okay, here it goes. I enjoyed the tale this game told orders of magnitude more than the original. Now, wait a second, before you authorize a drone strike on my house, the first game was amazing and its story was no different. It was earnest, honest, and not anything like what you would expect from a game that released in its console generation. But Dead Space 2 pulled off the nearly impossible trick of receiving a massive budgetary boost while keeping the spirit of the original intact. Are you insane? You cut off power to life support. There may be other survivors over here. Public sector is already beyond acceptable recovery conditions. I can't allow you to escape. Goodbye, Clark. Sure, we've lost the small, endearing, almost self-contained nature of the first game's story, but what we got in the sequel was the developers pouring just as much heart and soul into it with the added bonus of expanding on all the concepts introduced before. If Dead Space 1 is an underdog coming into the playoffs and nearly beating a seasoned team all on his own, then Part 2 is that same guy coming back after spending years of training and actually accomplishing that goal. Maybe it's not as much of an upset as some young upstart coming into the veteran AAA gaming space and wrecking everyone's shit with a quarter of the budget, but the quality and effort knobs have been cranked to 11 here. I mean, honestly, it's damn near perfect in my opinion. And I know you guys might not have been expecting that out of me. I do spend a majority of my time playing 100-hour RPGs with rich and immersive worlds, but this big-budget third-person shooter has me gushing for some reason. And, well, don't worry, it surprised me too. Maybe I'm just a sucker for dark and realistic science fiction stories with a twist of psychological horror thrown in. After all, one of my favorite movies is Event Horizon, but for whatever reason, I absolutely cannot recommend this story enough. Even if you're worried about your gaming skills not being up to snuff, I'd say an easy run is more than worth it to experience this tale for yourself. This might be one of the biggest blindsides I've had in a while, and maybe it'll have a similar effect on you. Or maybe it's the only game I've ever played that let me actively take part in shoving a needle into a person's eye, and that's something I can, I can really get behind. <laughs> Okay, so we all hopefully know what Dead Space is all about by now. Long corridors leading to open areas where piles of twisted bones and corrupted flesh jump you in a fight, requiring some limb from torso separation with light physics puzzles on top for good measure. And in that sense, Dead Space 2 is certainly not reinventing the wheel here. But what they have done is what any developer should do for a good sequel. They brought nearly the same exact formula to the table, but with small additions and even smaller alterations that have what was old feeling new again, aka shit that the gaming industry never does anymore. The main alteration that immediately comes to mind is a much larger focus on using the game's telekinesis mechanic to better use your environment as a weapon. Now don't get me wrong, blowing off a leg and then two arms is still the go-to move, but 
Literally nothing is more satisfying than picking up a long, sharp implement and firing it into these guys with such force that it literally pins their lifeless carcass to a wall. No joke, this is a kind of therapy for me and you know what, I'm not ashamed to say that. Of course, this was something that was possible to some degree in the original game with stuff like buzz saws, but here you'll notice these environmental elements are present in nearly every fight you're going to have, and now even the necromorph's own limbs can be used as a weapon against them, really changing things up. After taking out one of these things, sharpened bone spikes, you can pick it up and skewer them with it, and now that I'm thinking about it, I'm not too sure if this is a returning mechanic from the first game that I just never used. Well, regardless, it is fun as hell and even helped me conserve ammo in more than a few situations. This mechanic really plays into your target choices in a fight. A higher priority target might be launching projectiles at you from afar and he might be the obvious choice when there's just low level melee baddies simultaneously rushing you. But taking these guys out first means filling the environment with potentially deadly weapons to use against the stronger ones. At first, I had issues instinctively opting for this tactic, but it wasn't more than a few hours till I really grasped the concept and was making use of every available option in combat. Sticking with the game's combat, I did something a little differently compared to my playthrough of the first game. If you'll remember, I was a little let down at how relatively easy Dead Space 1 was. I mean, I did die a few times, but for 99% of the game I was steamrolling enemies with a starting weapon and even ended up selling my other weapons because I was never really in a position where I needed anything else. So when it came time to start Dead Space 2, I opted for the next step up in difficulty. And I will say right now with no doubt in my mind that this is the true way to experience this game. And no, I'm not one of those assholes that thinks difficulty necessarily translates into good gameplay, and anyone who stuck around for one of my streams knows I'm not MLG material by any stretch of the imagination. Are you guys serious? How about now? Just come out. Just You joined me already. You're willing to come out. Alright. I need you to run through this door now. I'm a little upset. I'm a little upset with you guys right now. I'm going to be honest. I'm more disappointed than anything if we're being totally honest. But despite this choice sending me to the game over screen a hundred times more than the first game, the increased number of enemies and absolute brutality of even the smaller skirmishes made for so much more of a satisfying experience. I would come to a wide open combat scenario and die over and over again, and instead of blaming RNG or hoping I'd do better next time, I was changing up my tactics and trying to better utilize the environment in my favor. Did I miss a few explosive canisters scattered around? or? Was it just me forgetting to use my stasis ability again? After getting absolutely demolished in an area, I loaded up my save game and strapped in with the intention of changing up my strategy and trying to shoot more accurately while fighting off an absolute onslaught of bad guys. At the end of one of these more punishing fights, I always felt like I survived just by the skin of my teeth, which was incredibly satisfying. And looking back, I bet this would have made the first game so much more enjoyable by comparison. If I had to guess, I would wager this was the intended experience the developers were going for. As Dead Space 2 went on, the difficulty curve angled more and more towards a 90 degree drop and I was just excited as hell to see what nearly impossible situation they put me in next. Instead of shooting gallery level enemies rushing me from far away while I picked them off with ease like in the first game, I was being swarmed from all sides and while it was teeth grindingly difficult, it also felt incredibly fair. For example, I might get hit by a necromorph from behind that I just didn't even know was there, but then in fighting him I'd notice where he came from and then I would start noticing all the entries into the room, counting windows and air vents. Then I would just demolish the entire fight. It felt like it asked for the perfect amount of effort out of me. I never restarted a fight saying, oh, how the hell was I supposed to avoid that? I was honestly in awe at how much fun I was having this time around, and just to reiterate, I really, really enjoyed the first game, but to further drive that point home, here's a nearly end game fight from Dead Space 1. I'm taking a lot of damage here, but as you can see, that's mostly due to me not needing to worry about avoiding attacks. And there's no real strategy being deployed. Necromorphs are showing up from nearly all sides, but at such a long distance that I can just pop them with stasis, blow off a couple limbs, and eat any damage from enemies I neglected 
while slowly picking my shots. Honestly, looking at it now, it seems like a big downgrade given the context. Now, taking a look at an endgame fight in Dead Space 2, and it is a night and day comparison. Necromorphs are getting right in my face, and I'm having to pick targets on the fly at an insane pace. I'm needing to use crowd control by using pain states to pop multiple enemies with non-lethal shots just to get a microsecond of breathing room so I can line up the more damaging stuff. I'm also needing to react way faster to threats here. As you can see, I'm moving my mouse a mile a minute trying to keep up with these fools, and instead of reloading, I was having to switch to another weapon just to make sure I wasn't left open for a few cheap hits, which by the way is all it takes for these guys to take me down, despite me having a fully upgraded suit. Despite the fact that I make a living trying to describe my experience with a video game, it's just really hard to put words together that will tell you how satisfying this is but the chaos and pace at which most fights took place forced me to play better and by the end I just felt like an absolute badass, which is what I expect from most action games. Listen, I know this sounds like me bragging at how great I am at this game, but believe me, I died easily a hundred times or more in this playthrough, but each time I was completely stoked to jump back in and see how I could better approach the skirmish that got the best of me. If you take any advice from me in this video, give Dead Space 2 a try on Survivalist. It felt to me like the perfect combination of difficulty and satisfaction. Trust me, you will not regret it. And if you've been paying attention to the footage up to this point, you might have noticed a small difference between the first and second games. One that's tiny but adds a very dynamic feeling to each fight. Instead of enemies just spitting out items on death, you need to do extra damage once you've downed them to collect any kind of reward. This really switched up my approach to fights, and even though it's this small little alteration, it felt like a perfect direction to take the game's combat in. Now, it really doesn't matter how much damage it is as long as the enemy's down, which does help it not feel cheap, but once you realize even throwing a bloody hand at them counts, it sort of cheapens the effect to a degree. On top of that, I really liked having to use secondary weapons this time around. Like I said in my last video, I really never felt the need to use something other than the starting plasma cutter since it was easily the most efficient weapon in the game, but I routinely needed to switch weapons to better deal with groups or certain enemy types this time around. It felt really good to be in a bad situation until I pulled out the pulse rifle to get a little room or using the javelin to not only crucify a necromorph but its secondary fire to electrocute the others around him. Unlike the first game, I often found myself nearly out of ammo, although I only ever truly ran out once. Still though, the stress of running low had me using my other weapons, which is good, and all around, I guess the takeaway is I just absolutely loved the combat here. The additions and alterations all combined together to make a much more satisfying experience than the first, and again, I loved the first game's combat. So that really threw me for a loop. As the game went on, I kept meeting bigger and bigger challenges, and this led to a real feeling of accomplishment when I got to the end. As Isaac took off his helmet and breathed a sigh of relief, I was right there with him. Of course, you guys know Dead Space ain't all action, and on that note, I'm happy to say the slow-building dread of exploring a place recently invaded by an alien corpse virus is still 100% present. And what I mean by that is, there's still a lot of quiet time for you to really soak in your surroundings. The in-your-face way the game starts might have you believing otherwise, but even a few minutes into that very sequence, you'll see enough slow-building atmosphere to disprove that little worry. This time around, the place you're exploring has been more recently overrun, so you get this closer connection between the environment and the events that happened here to make the environment look like it does. At first, I was worried the team would add more action to the game, throwing off the carefully balanced ratio achieved in the first, but Instead, the guys at Visceral just expanded the size of everything, so an increase on one side meant an even increase on the other. So if my little tirade on the combat got you worried, trust me, you don't have to be. You're still gonna spend plenty of time slowly skulking through dark hallways with blood-smeared walls while a single light fixture flickers off in the distance. And do keep in mind, I come into horror games wanting to spend more time in the dark, feeling around for a light switch, and less time partaking in pulse-pounding action, so... This game getting such high marks from me despite having so much action really says something about how effective that horror is. Continuing with the theme of additions, the zero gravity portions have made a return, but this time with the added bonus of full 360 degree movement, which is exactly what this mechanic needed. It feels like the next obvious upgrade to make for a sequel, and it works perfectly here. You're not going to see it very often, but when you do, it's almost always a fun time. 
plus it helps break up the gameplay once you've spent a long portion of the game either blasting eldritch horrors or walking through their aftermath. The workbenches make their obvious return, and the upgrade system works just as well as it did before, only this time I felt like I was less flush with power nodes at the end. The physics-based puzzles seem to be slightly more complicated than they were in the first game, forcing me to align mirrors and move stuff around in the environment more with Kinesis. Of course, they still aren't going to hit Silent Hill levels of challenging, but then again, they help break up the general gameplay loop and walk that thin line between being complicated enough that it doesn't become a bore, but also simple enough that I can typically figure them out just by looking them over a few seconds. So they're not going to give your brain a workout, but they still serve their purpose very well. Obviously, the pride and joy of the series is still alive and kicking, that being the limb dismemberment system. And very true to form, they give you about five bajillion hints as to how that works, including in-game audio logs, actual graffiti in the environment, and obtrusive tutorial messages. And while we're on the subject, man, these messages stick around way too damn long. Continuing with these sort of downsides, the new enemies are all really interesting and bring their own strategies to the combat, but two of them really piss me off in very specific situations. This acid-spitting asshole is fine enough on his own, but later on in the game, as the difficulty is ramping up and the swarms of necromorphs seem to number in the hundreds, these guys will show up and spit their sludge at you from across the room. And with the chaos of fighting off nearly infinite amounts of other bad guys, you'll often not hear his call out, so you'll have no idea he's even in the area until you get hit by him. And to be fair, this wouldn't be such an issue if his long distance shoot stomach acid at you from beyond the visible playfield attack just damaged you. Honestly, I was pretty flush with healing items nearly this entire playthrough, but on top of the damage, it also prevents you from running while slowing down your walk speed to an absolute crawl. Once this jerk gets a hit in on you, you're almost guaranteed to subsequent death if there's any other enemies still in play. So I learned to keep my head on a swivel and look out for his half-melted form, but I'd still get the odd cheap hit from him. And rounding off the list is this bigger sort of mid-boss type of melee-based guy with long arms. Dealing with him isn't much of an issue most of the time, just a quick stasis shot and unload on all of his weak points, but he has a lunging jump attack that once activated, the game just gives you zero tools to deal with. I mean, Isaac's run speed is relatively slow, and instead of focusing on mobility, the game pushes fast thinking and even faster target finding, but I couldn't find any way to knock him out of this attack, and a slow run speed matched with the absence of any kind of dodge mechanic, well, your only hope once he initiates this move is to pray that you were already out of range when he started it. Because if you weren't, it doesn't matter how far you run and which direction you are getting hit. Maybe getting this move a buttload of wind up or some kind of obvious startup frames would have helped, but as it is, if he's already in the air, it's out of your hands. And in a game so perfectly balanced for satisfying combat, this one enemy feels really out of place and kind of lazily implemented if you ask me. On the plus side though, you no longer need an external mouse fix patch to get the PC port working well and that's really cool. That being said, I had some real issues lining up my mouse's sensitivity with the in-game sensitivity slider. It took me a real long time to get the perfect equilibrium between the two, but I am willing to admit this might just be an issue with me and how I like to play. By now, you guys may have noticed that I didn't really give an overview of how this game plays and instead skipped straight to specific examples of what has changed. And well, that's because a majority of Dead Space 2 is just Dead Space 1, and that is a compliment. Too often in the AAA gaming space, developers throw the baby out with the bathwater when a sequel comes around, and while it may be an awesome game, it's just not what we wanted from a follow-up. <clears throat> RE4. Sorry, I must add something to my throat. Anyways, it's nice to see that these guys were competent enough in their original formula that they only saw to add to it instead of taking away. So if you did like Dead Space 1, I just cannot foresee a reason why you wouldn't like Part 2, but that does set us down a very interesting path. No matter how much I absolutely loved this gameplay experience, the public at large seems to not be in agreement with me. Sales for Part 2 were abysmal if the scant amount of info on Wikipedia is to be believed. I've seen a lot of varied numbers, but it looks like the game made back maybe a third of its original investment. And to be honest, going in, I expected the game to bear that fact in its gameplay. I expected some cheap, ramped up sequel that dropped everything the original was about. And I know I've made this comparison already, but once again, it is the most apt analogy I can think of. Dead Space 1 was the first Resident Evil game in the series in a lot of ways. 
Sure, it's more of an action game, but both utilized an isolating setting, slow building tension, and a lot of quiet time to not only engage the player, but cover up for what was a meager budget. Despite what makes them similar in a video game sense though, they both just kind of hold their own place in their own respective series. And if that's true, I think you guys know what Dead Space 2 is. Yeah, exactly. It's basically the RE2 of the series. With a massive following from the first game and a larger pool of resources to pull from, Dead Space 2 showed us all the things the first game could only hint at with audio logs and journal entries. They finally had the money to show us a full-scale necromorph invasion, much like our second trip to Raccoon City showing us what a citywide zombie outbreak would really look like. Through the first hours of the game, I just kept getting images of the second Resident Evil in my head, and yeah, maybe that's because I'm obsessed with the series, but maybe it's also because they seem so spiritually connected. Both titles completely replicated the last game's full experience, but used their new resources to add to that base formula instead of forming a totally new one. And yeah, there's certainly an argument for stagnation when this trick gets repeated too often, but generally it's what I look for in my sequels. Sure, Dead Space 2 dials the action knob far past 11, but it also gives me those quiet treks through a ruined environment with light fixtures swinging overhead and bloody handprints covering the wall. So I guess you might be wondering what I'm getting at here. Well, I'll just come right out and say it. Dead Space 2 was the most fun experience I've had with a video game in several years. I was absolutely glued to my screen the entire time, and with the addition of the challenge from survival mode, I just couldn't put this one down. It was this awesome and satisfying ramping up of stakes, and I swear to god, the last four hours felt like a roller coaster ride that I just can't get out of my head. I know it's common to use this as an example of EA meddling and turning a niche horror title into this shallow action blockbuster, and maybe, maybe there are elements of that present here, but honestly, I didn't feel any part of this game, either the action or the horror that wasn't also represented in the original. To me, this just felt like the perfect follow-up to Visceral's original creative vision, and I know that is not a very popular take. Now, I'm always willing to admit when it might just be my subjective opinion here on this channel, but this time I genuinely think some of you guys might have misjudged this one, and honestly, it's understandable. The general opinion seems to be that this was an example of corporate oversight, but I'm just not seeing it. Maybe even the touch of EA is enough to poison a game in our minds, but this was some of the most fun I can remember having with a game, and the only thing I ask is that if you already own it, maybe pull it off the shelf or reinstall it and give it another go. Sure, there's always a chance that I'm wrong here, and if so, maybe you just wasted a few scant hours of your life, but if I'm right, maybe you just got yourself a memorable experience that'll stay with you for a long time. And if you ask me, well, that's a gamble worth taking. Okay, so I'm not going to string you guys along for some kind of big dramatic reveal. The fact of the matter is, Dead Space 2 is an absolute graphical marvel. Every little corner of every screen seemed to be absolutely popping with detail and I just could not stop being impressed by it. During my playthrough, there were times where I would just sit there and stare slack-jawed at an absolute masterpiece of lighting, texture work, and design that should have rightly won awards. It really seems like every square inch of the game is jam-packed with hundreds of these little microscopic details, and despite this being the most I've been impressed with the game's presentation since the remakes of RE2 and 3, I'm just kind of struggling on where to start with it all. You compromised the compound, you idiot. And with that in mind, it wouldn't be fair to get into the subject without mentioning the giant necromorph elephant in the room. So yes, this game has a very very different look than what you're used to in Dead Space 1. In my first video on the series, I gave the original Dead Space very high marks for completely nailing this old rusted metal and utilitarian slash industrial look. But immediately upon starting part 2, it became very clear that they were going for a much different approach this time around. One of the first things that jumped out to me when first taking control of Isaac was that the starting area might have more color in it than 99% of the last game put together. In the original, a very warm color palette was used most of the time, and this factory-inspired sheet metal design could be seen in almost every part of the game. But this time around, you're going to be seeing all kinds of blues, yellows, and greens, which can be kind of jarring at first. Now, don't get me wrong, colors like that were seen in the last game, but mostly in the form of accent lighting, sort of like visual indicators of gameplay devices like doors or entryways. 
And that is still the case here to a degree, but these lights share the stage with environments that look like people could actually live inside of them without taking part in some kind of 1960s Russian art house propaganda piece about the dangers of capitalism or something. And as a horror title, or at least a game that aims to horrify its player, you'd figure bright visuals would sort of play against that idea, but I think the in-universe explanation sort of takes care of that. Dead Space 1 took place on a decrepit, nearly decommissioned planet cracker, and this time around we're on an honest-to-goodness space station. People live, work, and spend their leisure time here. The change from drab and brown to colorful and pretty sort of makes sense in this context. I guess the best analogy I can think of, it's like going from a 70s era nuclear sub to a modern cruise ship. On the plus side though, the new more pleasing look to everything helps aid in driving home just how much desolation has taken place here. On the Ishimura, I kind of had a hard time telling the difference between parts of the ship that were ransacked by the living dead and parts of it that were just run down and barely functional. This time around, you really get to feel like this was a horrible event in what seemed like a pretty awesome place to live. So while it may not keep the same design language as the first game, I think it works to create a similar feel, it just takes a different path to get to that goal. And for you purists, there are still areas that'll give you flashbacks to the original. Old, rusted environments left in disarray that, if anything, is the dev showing you that, yeah, we decided to do something else, but we still got that old Dead Space talent in us. And as a really cool little nod, you actually get to hop aboard the Ishimura one last time in this game, and I think this section of the game serves as a tiny microcosm of the effort these guys were looking to put in. They could have easily gotten away with just recycling the original environments from part one, and I would have still been psyched to jump back aboard the aging planet cracker, but instead they seem to have remodeled whole areas, or at least added so much to the original assets that it's easy to think they did. Since EarthGov got a hold of this thing and tried to scrub it for every piece of info about the marker they could, you'll see work lights, portions of the ship that have been disassembled, and a kind of white tarp over some areas, like they were dealing with an infectious disease. As for the actual game we came here to talk about, just expect all the small post-processing effects that made the original look so damn sharp and impressive despite not looking that great underneath it all, but this time layered over a game that looks like it came from the PS4 or Xbox One generation. The small details like absolutely gorgeous lighting, dust particles, and debris floating in the air have all made a return and seem to be rendered at a much higher resolution this time around. The jaw-dropping perspective correct shadow casting is back, and even though it's only reserved for certain dynamic light sources, it still looks better than a majority of games being released today. On top of all the original little touches of detail that made it easy not to notice a relatively low-res approach to texture work and 3D model geometry, We've got even more enhancements, but if you ask me, there's only one really worth talking about. One little effect that's so damn impressive, I honestly struggle to find the words to describe it. And I know this is going to sound so dumb after that buildup, but I was walking along one of the earlier areas and managed to come across a spot where the lights started going out, leaving me in total darkness. And while moving the camera around, I noticed something. The green glow from Isaac's helmet was actually casting an amber shaded light onto the environment. Guys, honestly, when this happened, I just stopped for a split second and said out loud, you absolute madmen. I mean, really, they had no reason to do this. The effect of the green glow that was coming from his visor already looked great, but they put in the extra bit of effort to make it a dynamic light source. And if one day someone who worked on this game gets to see this video, let me just say, I cannot tell you how much I appreciate this kind of effort and sheer will to make a convincing look that you guys put into this game. Cheers, guys. There is not enough people like you in the industry, and that is a goddamn shame. And since we're talking about lighting, I noticed the hard lines that delineated light combs in the first game have been softened this time around, creating a more natural and realistic look to light sources that are shining into really dark areas. And while I do admit that this is the more authentic way to go as far as replicating the behavior of real light in the real world, I kind of prefer the previous look. I feel like the reason I like the more stylized look of the lighting in Dead Space 1 was because it reminds me of playing old PC games and seeing all the cool stuff devs were doing to replicate real-time lighting. That being said, the lighting in this game still blows me away, it's just not as stylistically pleasing in my opinion. One thing that setting this game on a massive space station afforded the dev team was being able to really change up the look of different areas without stretching my suspension of disbelief. If I would walk out of one area in the Ishimura and into one with a completely different approach to color, design, and decoration, it would be a little jarring, but here going from a bright, colorful daycare section to the dark and brooding architecture of the Unitologist Church just feels like a natural progression, honestly. 
Sometimes I would come across a window looking out at the rest of the space station, and I know they're just sky boxes with low res 2D textures, but the look of this place just had this perfect sense of scale to it. Kind of like I'd spent too much time in a dark and claustrophobic hallway and the devs wanted to make sure to give me a look at what I was really inside of, so I kept that perspective of being this tiny little part of this giant game world. And I didn't notice this little tidbit while I was actually playing, but going through my captured footage, it seems like there's a progression from day to night, from the start of the game to a few hours in. Once again, a little detail that just makes me appreciate a team that goes that extra mile. I did have one tiny issue though, one that I think most people probably don't care about. In the first game, the communications you had with the rest of your team looked to be pre-rendered, had motion cap work, and an absolute ton of detail, where it seems like this time around, video comms are actual in-game graphics, and they don't have the same flair as they used to. Continuing on that note, faces in part two are much more animated with way more points of articulation than before, but they also include a more stylized look to them. Now, I'm not exactly sure why, but the style they went with here sort of reminds me of the very recognizable looking faces in the Time Splitters series and that one stealth game I reviewed back before I knew what I was doing, Second Sight. Just like before, this game was an absolute breeze to get running at a locked 100 frames per second, with not even a hint of stutter or bad frame pacing, which, for a game that looks this good, is still very impressive. Back when I first tried Dead Space 2 out, I was running it on an old GTX 770 and an even older Phenom X4 so great optimization is the name of the game here. I imagine those of you looking to run the PC version on anything made in the last decade should have no issues nailing a solid frame rate. And speaking of versions, why don't we check out the other ways you can play Dead Space 2. If you'll remember, last time we looked at both the 360 and PS3 versions of the game, and the PS3 port won by a pretty narrow margin, so let's start this little comparison with the reigning champ. Right off the bat, I was absolutely floored with how sharp and clear the picture was in Dead Space 2's PS3 port. With the first game's console release, I noticed the expected jump down in quality with things like sharpness, and if I had to assume, I'd say this is due to some type of bilinear filter or some other type of adjustment that was meant to de-emphasize jackies on hardware that didn't do so well with anti-aliasing. But this time around, I felt like I was playing the PC version just with AA turned off. It was really really impressive. Especially when you put the last game's port and this one side by side, the difference in sharpness and clarity is just night and day. Keeping in mind both of these captures were obtained from the same PS3 with the same video output settings. So as far as visuals go, we are batting a thousand for sure. But sadly, the frame rate is a very, very different story. I'm not gonna lie, it's rough getting used to a hard cap of 30 FPS, but that's not exactly outside of your typical experience with hardware from the previous generation. The slowdown from 30 FPS, however, was a much bigger thorn in my side. Scenes with a lot of fog or smoke on screen seemed to drop frames like crazy, and even opening the store in the PS3 version showed some serious slowdown. Now, say what you want about Dead Space 1's ports and their very clear visual downgrade, at least they played well. The constant dips in frame rate here made combat very, very, very hard for me. Now, I'm sure people who are used to playing on console will probably not consider this much of an issue, but for me it was something I just couldn't stop noticing, so I guess take that for what it is. Other than the frame rate though, I couldn't find any missing graphical or lighting tricks, so that's good. I did however find that both console versions implemented this weird looking background motion blur during cutscenes. I assume to make up for the lower frame rate, maybe? And it is a little distracting, but not so bad that you won't get used to it eventually. So I do have to say I'm a little disappointed with the champ's performance this time around, so let's see if things fare a little differently on the 360. And if you'll remember last time I had to convert the analog component video output of my Launch Era 360 using my Frame Meister, and some of you guys that were familiar with the 360 version of Dead Space rightly complained that a lot of detail was lost in this process. So I asked my little brother if I could borrow his Elite Model 360 for this video, and he was nice enough to say yes. Which means we're looking at a direct digital-to-digital -digital capture this time around, and maybe it's just me, but it seems like the 360 version wins in the sharpness department. The PS3 footage that I captured does have a bit of a darker look to it, and I can't tell if that's affecting my decision, but the good news is no matter which console port you go with, you're going to get some seriously impressive video. On the frame rate side of things, the same target of 30 FPS is present in this version, only showing much less slowdown in my opinion. In the 360 port, you can see we've totally lost the slowdown that took place in the PS3's item store, and overall I just found this port to be a much more smooth experience. 
That being said, I've never really done well with the 360's controller, so I was aiming better on the PS3, but I think the 360 still takes the lead regardless. I can get used to an oddly laid out controller, but slow down is a different beast altogether. So in an odd turn of events, I have to recommend people stay away from my beloved PS3 this time around, although I'm more than willing to admit that I may be a little more sensitive to these issues than most. So I guess just go with whatever version you can get a hold of, but just to help the decision making process along, here's each version of the game side by side. Like I said before, the visual downgrade is far less noticeable than you would expect going from 1440p to an internally upscaled 720p, with the only obvious signs being a much more alias picture on console. As far as I'm concerned, jaggies aren't the worst thing in the world and even sometimes gives the illusion of added sharpness, so if you can't or don't want to play this on PC, these home console versions are more than a great solution visually speaking, but since I don't play shooters well with controllers, I can't really tell you I'd choose them for myself. Okay, so I guess it turns out having to sum up my feelings on Dead Space 2's presentation is actually really easy. This is one of the most impressive showings I've seen in years. Now, it obviously doesn't come close to the newer games in terms of raw power, but instead beats them in artistic merit. These guys really did try to include every possible little effect in addition the hardware would support. Things like environment design and interactivity don't always get lumped in with the game's look, but if you ask me, Dead Space 2 makes a solid case for that being a little short-sighted. The more stylized and less realistic looking faces than the first game look better in motion than your typical photorealistic approach because when something already looks a little cartoony, well you're not as likely to care when animations don't exactly line up with real life. On the flip side, the lighting is probably some of the most technically impressive and best all around looking implementations I've seen in recent games. So specifics aside, Dead Space 2's visual presentation gets a gigantic thumbs up from me. That style and feel of the original shows through perfectly in this sequel, but with about a million additions that might have you believing it's a recent release. I know most people don't play games specifically for their graphical look, but maybe give Dead Space 2 a spin for that exact reason. Hey, if you end up not liking the way the game looks, on the plus side, you have an incredibly fun gameplay experience to fall back on, so it's a win-win situation. Oh God. When Dead Space first released, I remember being blown away at such a unique and innovative title having graced the same exact console generation that had been doing nothing but cloning Gears of War and Call of Duty for the last few years. And with Dead Space 2 getting such a big increase in budget and more attention from its EA overlords, I just kind of assumed it would be another series that had all of its edges rounded down so it could fit in a more traditional box. And I think most people felt the same because of the massive 40 to 60 million dollar budget given to Visceral, only a very small portion of that was made back in sales, and if you ask me, that is an honest to goodness crime. This game is everything the original was in my opinion, but with a few additions, and when you're making a follow up to a popular game, I know it should be common knowledge to only add to the proven formula instead of taking away, but I think if anything, Shinji Mikami has taught us that this is not always the mindset developers go into these things with. So if you've never played Dead Space 2 because you thought it was a big budget cash grab that took away all the personality that the original had, well, I'm here to let you know it is absolutely not the case. This is a real marvel in an industry where sequels are very rarely handled this well. So I guess I'll put it as simply as I can. Did you really enjoy Dead Space? Do you want more of it but in a prettier package? Well, I've got some good news for you. Oh, and before I go, I just wanted to thank all of you for showing this little project such massive amounts of support. You guys are absolute sweethearts, and here's hoping I see each and every one of you next time, right here on the Dead Space Retrospective. We just lost! Yo, what's up guys? Thanks for making it to the end of a very, very long one. I had so much to say about this game that I just couldn't stop writing, so sorry about that. If you like this video but haven't seen the first entry in the series, I'll have other entries in the retrospective linked here on screen, and if you really, really like this video, maybe think about supporting my efforts over on Patreon. I actually use Patreon to decide what series I cover next and what order I should make my videos in, on top of those guys getting early access to my videos when they first get uploaded, which is sometimes weeks before anyone else sees them. If you aren't able to though, that's totally fine. Just know that I'm secretly mad at you and I don't think we could be friends anymore. Alright guys, peace out and make sure to make wise choices and stay true to your boyfriend or girlfriend. That's very important.